Hi, everybody. Welcome to this month's installment of Ballpark Figures. I am your host, Shakia Taylor. I am a uh, newly named sports and culture writer at the Chicago Tribune and a former Sabre winner. Uh, thank you all for joining us. I am very, very excited to have my cousin, <laughs> Randy Wilkins. He is the director of ESPN 30 for 30, The Captain. Um, Randy is a three-time Emmy Award-winning writer, director, and editor from the Bronx. His latest effort is directing The Captain, a seven-episode docuseries on New York Yankees legend Derek Jeter that premieres this month on ESPN. He also directed episodes of Dear, featuring Spike Lee and The Me You Can't See, the Oprah and Prince Harry show on mental health, both for Apple Plus. His commercial work includes the Jackie Robinson Day spot for Major League Baseball and the Pepsi Holiday Give Back. Outside of directing, Randy has served as lead editor on numerous Spike Lee joints, including She's Gotta Have It and Rodney King for Netflix. Randy. <laughs> Hello. Hello. How are you? Good, you? Doing well, doing well, hoping that my uh, dog doesn't start going crazy in the back. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. We love Tim. Everybody <laughs> loves Tim. Um, <clears throat> we were talking before we started recording, and I felt like we were having a great conversation, so I'm going to just jump right back into what we were talking about. Um, so you directed The Captain, um, and what went into preparing for something of this magnitude? I think the biggest thing is relying actually on the baseball career because it, it creates like a natural arc and allows you to figure out where the um, actual drama and conflict and emotional ups and downs can be in the story. Um, you know, obviously Derek was very successful in his career, but there were a lot of lows and a lot of challenging times, both on and off the field. So I think the easiest way to prepare and structure it was to just follow his career. And they were kind of um, these benchmarks to, to allow us to really get into other storytelling uh, arcs. So we were really exhaustive in just detailing every moment in his career, whether it was a big moment, a small moment, um, the people around him, so some of the players, Joe Torre, Joe Girardi, Cashman, um, and we just use that as kind of our, our roadmap to, to help build out the story. <clears throat> so when you were doing all of that, what type of research like goes into it? Who's doing the research? Is it you? Do you have a team? Are you, you know, outsourcing with scholars? Oh, no, it's, it was a team. Uh, the, the one benefit of being a Yankees fan doing this is I knew Derek's career. Like I had watched it literally from the first game in Seattle to the last game uh, in Boston, even though we don't really count the Boston games is really the final game at Yankee stadium. Uh, but it was a team. I mean, the producers, Alex Cirillo and Gabe Honig uh, did a lot of research. We have a great co-producer, Sasha Gardner, who did a lot of research for us. He was almost like our in-house uh, researcher. Um, we read a lot of stuff, read a lot of books. Um, our archival producer at the time, Sheila Maniar, had uh, put together this insane database of articles over Derek's career, even pre-career. Um, so yeah, it was like a, a total team effort. We were all reading the same books and we would just have meetings where we just discussed um, some of the insights from the book, some of the things that we remembered as fans. Um, it was it was exhaustive. We we took about a month, which which probably wasn't enough time. And you know when you think about something of this scale, um, mm -hmm. but we were like really dedicated. I mean, we were be in the office for however many hours, but we were doing work outside of the office. So it was really like 10, 12 hour days within this month period of research. But it, again, it also helped that I knew Derek's career. Um, Gabe is also a huge Yankees fan, so he knew Derek's career. Alex was familiar with it. Um, Sasha, someone that you know, is a, a brilliant guy who is also a huge baseball fan. He's a Cubs and Mariners fan. So, um, and also uh, 
our line, she became our line producer, but Jenna McCrary was also great just helping us build out the story and finding emotional moments that she felt could like really, really work well. So total team, team effort. Like I, I couldn't have done it without them, but I also couldn't go out to outside scholars because we're telling the story. So um, it was something that we had to do because we were also story building at the same time. What was that? Pro what was the project like to work on as a Yankees fan? I know that you try to keep Randy the professional and Randy the fan somewhat separate, but I have to imagine at some point Randy the fan started to jump out a little bit. Uh, Randy the fan <laughs> jumped out before we started filming. You know, it was like when I first got the gig, Randy the fan was like besides himself. Uh, when we first started, it was kind of like you know, this is crazy that. I have this honor and privilege to tell Derek's story. Um, and it helped again, like with the research. So Randy, the fan popped up in the story building because it was, I had to lean on those experiences. But yeah, once we got going, Randy, the fan completely disappeared. Like it had nothing to do with it outside of when I would meet like Reggie Jackson or Brian Cashman or Jorge or Bernie, like there would be a moment there. Mm -hmm. uh, but once we had to get to work, we got to work. We didn't really, uh, we didn't really, nobody was impacted by my fandom. You know, it was like, yeah, I have a job to do. So that's more important than my, my Yankee fandom. Did you have any difficulty talking about controversial issues or topics with Derek at all? No, I don't think so. I mean, not from what I remember. Uh, he was, he was open to talk about things that people wanted to talk about. Um, I know people want to talk about A-Rod. We definitely talk about A-Rod. People want to talk about gift baskets. We talked about gift baskets. And, uh, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of, there's actually a lot of internal strife that Derek had with the Yankees over the years and conflict with Brian Cashman in the front office, not with the Steinbrenners. He always had a, like, tremendous relationship with the Steinbrenners. But he, at time, he had a rocky relationship with Brian Cashman in the front office, and we get into that. You know, so he didn't, he didn't shy away from anything. He was, he was open. You know, he's, he's still big on like protecting teammates. So I think he didn't want to put people in a position where they kind of were felt like they got blindsided and like would have to fend for themselves. Mm -hmm. um, so I think things that focused on him, he definitely talked about and him still being the captain by nature. You know, he wanted to make sure that he protected his teammates in the sense that they wouldn't all of a sudden have to answer questions in the media because we just came up with this story that they weren't prepared to be in the film. With, with him being so open, right? And, you know, you having access to his family in this, like, what did you learn that you didn't know before? And what would we learn that we didn't know before if that's different? I think one thing that I learned was how impactful his childhood as a biracial black kid impacted him both on the field and off the field. Um, I think I underestimated that experience and how that shaped his worldview. Um, of course, I was like thrown off by how like intense he is. Like he's very intense and has this edge that like turns on immediately. But I think the thing that I was most fascinated by as the story was going on was just how much of his upbringing really impacted how he viewed the world and how he was going to function in the world, especially in New York. So, um, yeah, that was that was the biggest takeaway. It's just that you know when people are staring at you just because you're biracial and you're um, in a predominantly white city in the Midwest, and you stick out like a sore thumb just because you exist, you know, it's going to influence the way that you interact with others and how you navigate through things. So I think. Um, one thing that Derek always talked about was he loved people watching him play, you know, and all eyes were on him and he like thrived off of that. But then off the field, he didn't really like people watching him or looking at him. So it was this interesting uh, balance that he had to strike that I think really drove him as a player and also influenced the way that he interacted with the public while he was playing. Um, so, yeah, that was probably the most fascinating thing. What do you think, like, I mean, based on just this part alone, you know, we're hearing that 
Derek was one way in public and completely different in private. And I would imagine that's because obviously being a athlete celebrity in New York, you kind of want to keep part of your life private. Um, in what do you think young athletes today could take from the way Derek handled the media then? Um, I don't, I, I, I'm not sure. This is a different world, different time, right? So mm-hmm. like social media has completely changed the way we consume and perceive and interact. So Derek wouldn't have been able to be Derek now that he was back in the day. So I think we have to like contextualize that. Mm-hmm. I think I think the biggest takeaway is no distractions to take away from winning. And I feel like that's ultimately why he created that persona outside of like the cultural identity stuff that I mentioned. Derek was determined to make sure that the focus focus was entirely on winning championships and nothing else mattered. So I think that that belief is a thing that most players could take away from Derek, that you don't do things to take away from the team and you don't do things to take away from the ultimate goal of winning. But with that said, I don't think every athlete has this like insatiable desire to win a championship like Derek did, like Derek. So I think you can take the idea, but people that are actually able to be disciplined enough to do that day in and day out for however long their career is, is like pretty rare. So um, it's kind of hard. I mean, he's just a different guy. I fully believe people like Derek Jeter, Kobe Bryant, Tiger Woods, Michael Jordan, they just have this switch in their mind that the rest of us just don't have. Like, yeah. <laughs> like they reach another level up there that we just don't get that, that drives them. I'm not sure I want it because it seems <laughs> to, you know, make you a, kind of come off a little crazy. Um, yeah. But, uh, was there anything that happened while you were filming that was just like fun, really funny, any like super fun moments? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, we did 90 interviews, so we had like all kind of personalities. Like uh, we interviewed Scott Robb, who is the journalist at Esquire at the time who wrote the infamous uh, Alex Rodriguez article that criticized Derek. And uh, he's a big time baseball fan. He's from Cleveland. He's a Guardians fan. And uh, his interview was on the same day as Reggie Jackson. So Reggie Jackson did his interview in the morning, then Scott came in and uh, Reggie and Scott met in the green room and Reggie Jackson's like literally undressing and like changing in front of us. So it was like a little weird that he was like changing in front of us, but he's like changing in front of Scott Robb and Scott Robb introduces himself because Reggie asked him like, what are you doing here? Why are you here? You're not a baseball player. And Scott Robb says, oh, I was a journalist, wrote for Esquire. And as soon as he said he was a journalist, like Reggie Jackson just started cursing him out, like just started like getting on it. But it was like playful. And he was like, I don't know if I could curse, but he was like, you're the mf that, you know, ruined my life and ruined players' lives. And Scott Robb is just like taking it and he's smiling. And he's like, he's, he's like this little kid that he's like getting cursed out by Reggie Jackson. And he thought it was like, the greatest thing that ever happened to him was to be in this like random green room in a studio and like get cursed out by Reggie Jackson. And it was just like, at the beginning it was awkward because you couldn't tell if like Reggie was being serious or not, but you could tell he was like playing, playing around with him. But like Scott Robb just like ate it all up. He was just like, this is the best thing that's like ever happened to me. So I think a lot of the interviews just, cause you had such, such diverse and, uh, colorful personalities that wanted to be there you know it, they wanted to be a part of the film that you know just led to great moments like that one and great interviews and yeah it was good it was fun okay um so <clears throat> there's a you interviewed michael jordan for this right yeah how did that come about uh he asked to be a part of it he like just reached- straight up asked yeah, he reached out to Mike Tolan, who was a, a producer of The Last Dance. So there was obviously a previous relationship there. And uh, Michael, through his assistant, reached out to Mike Mike Tolan and said that he wanted to be a part of it. Now, we had reached out to Michael, but uh, 
like schedule stuff and they were getting back to us like pretty late for our production schedule. And then like out of nowhere in May, uh, Tolan told us that Jordan was like, I want to be in this. Like, I don't want to miss out on it. And it was like, well, it's Michael Jordan. You know, we had, we were like, well, beyond production, we were almost done cutting the episodes. So, I mean, I'm a Bulls fan. Michael Jordan is like a hero of mine, a sports hero. So I was like, you know, we have to do this. I don't know how we're going to make this work, but we'll make it work somehow. So we figured it out and uh, went down, went down to, to Florida interviewed him that day and then left and then came right back to New York. And this was like right before our Tribeca screening. It was like the week before the Tribeca screening. So uh, yeah, very rare instance where Michael Jordan asked to be a part of something like this. And uh, yeah, we made it happen. Oh, that's amazing. I hope he gives us more memes. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if he is, but Derek is. Derek's definitely going to go. Oh, oh yeah. I'm yeah. ready for the memes. Um, yeah. So when people started hearing it was seven episodes, right? I saw a lot of like, why does he need seven episodes? What, what's happening in seven episodes? What is happening in seven episodes that this is seven episodes? I mean, I think the first thing is that his career was 20 plus years. You know, we don't, we don't start with the Yankees years. We start with his parents, you know? So we start with like, <laughs> we're, we're in the sixties and seventies to start this off. And I think people forget just how long Derek played and how many errors he kind of like covered. I mean, even if you look at the literal media in which Major League Baseball covered the games, it changed three or four times during Derek's career. I mean, you had like SD, you had 16 millimeter footage, then you had HD. Now you have like whatever it is now, you know, so he covered so many literal mediums that there's so, so much time to cover. And then when you add all the personal stuff, like this is a story about a, a human being that played baseball. It's not about a baseball player that happens to be a human. You know, like we get into who the person and who the man Derek Jeter is. And we talk about family. We talk about race. We talk about media. We talk about celebrity. All of those things, you need time to properly present all of that stuff to an audience for them to have enough time to digest it and engage with it. So... And there's also a balance you have to reach. There's so much baseball stuff that you have to cover that, but there's a lot of personal stuff and larger cultural stuff to get into. So seven episodes felt right. I mean, it was supposed to be six episodes and then we like pitched ESPN to get a seventh one that kind of acts as an epilogue to his Yankees career. And even then we were having trouble like figuring out what to take out, what to keep, you know, it's just, it's just a very robust story that I think a lot of people don't attach to Derek because he was boring with the media. And that was the only way that they really interacted with him. That's the only way that they know Derek was through these boring quotes for 20 years, which I get, but there's way more to it. And I think that Derek is one of the few American athletes where a lot of intersections kind of meet him in the middle. You know, he, he like covers so much and captures so much that you, you wouldn't be telling the story uh, to its fullest potential if you don't cover all of those topics. So um, that's why seven episodes. I mean, it, it could have been more, to be quite honest. Um, and there's just so, like, even, like, just the baseball stuff. I mean, there's so many dramatic series that he was a part of, but you have to give it time. You know what I mean? You have to really explore it. So, um, yeah, that's why it was seven episodes. So... I was at the premiere. Um, I've seen the first episode. It was great, by the way. Um, all bias and no bias. It was really, really great. Um, mm -hmm. But before the episode aired, Spike Lee told the story of how you came to be the director of this film. Can you tell everyone else who hasn't heard the story how that happened? Yeah, uh, Spike got one detail wrong. Uh, okay. So I'll clarify it, but it was uh, June of 2020. Uh, so the pandemic, the first wave of the pandemic was still going on and, you know, everybody's still in lockdown. And I got a call from Spike and, you know, he was checking in on me, making sure I was okay, you know, checking in on him to make sure he was okay. And then out of nowhere, he was like, well, who's your favorite Yankee? 
And like at the time, you know, nobody's playing sports. Like I'm not really thinking about sports and I'm like Derek Jeter, but why are you asking me this? Like, this is totally out of blue. It's not like we're going to a Yankee game anytime soon. Uh, and he said, well, Derek is doing a, decided to do a film on himself and I recommended you to direct it. And I like almost dropped the phone and was like, what is going on here? First of all, I was like shocked that Derek wanted to do a film on himself because at that time, my perception of him was what everybody else else's perception of him was. Uh, so I was thrown off by that and then obviously like floored that he would recommend me to Derek to tell his story. And I knew that Derek and Spike had a long relationship, like they're good friends. And uh, I had known that uh, if Derek had made this decision to make a film, he would want Spike to do it. But Spike was busy on another project at the time. That's where the detail is different. It was 9-11 Epicenters, not Kaepernick. He was already uh, working on that project, but he told Derek, I can't do it, but I have the perfect guy to, to do it. And I was that guy. So um, I was like incredibly humbled that Spike told Derek this. Um, and I met Mike Tolan and then I met Derek on a Zoom uh, maybe like a week later. And Derek and I hit it off right away. It was Derek, Spike and I. And um, it felt like I had known Derek my entire life. It was like odd. Like we just started talking as if we hadn't, you know, we were just like catching up. And um, we had that call, it was like for about 45 minutes, an hour. And, you know, I, I asked them point blank, like, are you going to be open in this film? Like, it, it can't be like how you dealt with the media. And he was like very clear that he understood that that's not what this required and that he was ready to, to open up with stuff. And um, maybe like a week or two later, I got the phone call that I got the gig and that's how it happened. Oh, that's amazing. I feel like I've talked to you throughout this process like yeah, yeah, from yeah. <laughs> finding out to starting it or whatever you knew, it's you knew always, me before everybody else did so <laughs> it's so fascinating like um just how all this stuff happens behind the scenes but one thing I never asked you is you interviewed 90 people for this how did you choose who to talk to what to ask them like what made people subject matter experts for wh wh wherever they were placed it goes back to that story structure that we had, like at the beginning, like that was basically our Bible. You know, we just to paint a picture for people. We had like a bullpen area, which was like this. We were in this, this office space. Everybody had their own room. You know, everybody was trying to be as safe as possible. But we had like one large space in the office that was our bullpen. And we had put up these cork boards that basically covered half of the room. And we basically put no cards. We had a year a note card for each year. And then that year we had like every baseball event, every personal event, every event culturally or of any kind of significance in New York city or America in that, in that year. So we had a column for each year, the eighties all the way till 20, 2014. Cause we treated the Marlins as something completely different. Uh, so when we had whittled down what we're going to be the, the points that we were going to touch on in the film and were a part, a part of the final story that we were telling, we just started compiling the interview list that corresponded with those story points. So there is the obvious, excuse me, the obvious ones like the core four and Joe Torrey and Brian Cashman and Hal Steinbrenner, the journalists became a big part of the story as well. So it was like just finding all the beat reporters and, um, columnists that could talk to things. Then we needed someone like yourself that could give us a larger cultural view of not just like Derek's career, but of baseball in America and how those things intertwine. Like everything was just based off of that, that Bible that we created for ourselves. And we knew who the important figures were. And it was just like, okay, who fits during what time, during what era, um, and just go after them and get them. You know, again, Derek's career is so vast. There were so many eras. There were people that come in and out of his life and his career rapidly. You know, so you have David Cohn and Daryl Strawberry, um, uh, uh, Tim Raines, 
Dave Winfield for like one part of his career. Winfield is in and out. Um, and then all of a sudden you have CC Sabathia and Joe Girardi and Joe Girardi, the manager, not the necessarily the player. Um, Jimmy Rollins as a competitor. Uh, you know, there's so many people that come in and out, even the journalists come in and out. So that's why we needed to talk to so many people. And also they gave us like a bunch of time. Like, I mean, we spoke to people for three, four hours. You know, most of the, I think the shortest interview outside of the like 45 hour ones was two and a half hours. You know what I mean? So I, I was sitting in this chair for like three, four hours, three interviews a day. Um, so we wanted to be as extensive and, and cover as much as possible. Um, but it just came back to that, that structure that we created. And then we went from there. Did you find that most people you asked to be in it were uh, pretty interested in participating? Oh yeah. They wanted to be a part of it. I, it was like remarkable to see how much love Derek has from a lot of people, you know, and, and they, again, they were like very generous with their time. You know, we were like, we need you for like three or four hours in the chair. And they're like, yeah, sure. No problem. It was always like a scheduling thing. Cause obviously these are busy people, but people were very enthusiastic to be a part of it. And I think that that just goes back to the person that Derek is and, and the teammate he was. Um, and it was like remarkable to see and feel the enthusiasm and commitment that people made for this film to make it as good as it could possibly be. And also, I mean, it was, it wasn't just all Yankees. I mean, we had like Nomar in there. We have Theo Epstein in there, Jimmy Rollins, like I mentioned, uh, people from different organizations are a part of this as well. So, and, and people that don't normally do stuff like this, like Roger Clemens, uh, is in this, um, Brian Cashman, Hal Steinbrenner, we got Hal. So, um, yeah, it was. it's a testament to, to who Derek is, I think. They weren't there for me. They were there for Derek, so. Uh, Mark is asking, is his favorite Yankee, Bernie Williams, included? Of course. Come on, man. We're not going to make a film without Bernie. Bernie was, uh, <laughs> besides Derek, Bernie was my favorite player, so he had to be in it. Uh, so, yeah, Bernie's in it, for sure. Is there anything on the cutting room floor that we would be interested in? Everything. Everything. Uh, yeah. I'm, well, yeah. I mean, there's a there's a lot of stuff. I mean, again, like if you think about, let's say seventy interviews are three to four hours long. There's a lot of great stuff in there that you could you could add or like make another episode out of. Um, there's a lot of bonus content actually that will live on ESPN Plus. Uh, there's a lot. I just, I, the answer is yes, not everything, but, uh, there's a, there lot a, of it. Uh, there's a lot of it. Um, so much to the point that I can't really remember off the top of my head. I'll, I'll jog my memory as we keep talking, but, um, yeah, I, I think one thing, so a lot of stuff that's on the cutting room floor, if you're a Yankees fan, there's a lot of stuff that's interesting because we wanted to make sure that this wasn't like a Yankee doc. You know, it's a it's a documentary about Derek Jeter who happened to play for the Yankees. And we didn't want to alienate people that aren't Yankees fans. Like we wanted this to be all inclusive, you know, baseball fans or uh, non-baseball fans alike. We just wanted to make sure that like people felt like they could access this as much as a Yankees fan. Uh, so we were very conscious of making sure that we didn't like cross the line of making this too like Yankee centric and getting into all the greater Yankee storylines, try to like keep everything through Derek. There's some moments where we like take a detour, but mm -hmm. uh, you know, we were conscious to not make this like just for Yankees fans. That's not fair. And like a lot of people wouldn't watch and I wouldn't blame them to be quite honest. So. Knowing what you do now about Derek, do you think he will ever come back for an old timer's day? Will Derek come back for an old timer's day? Mm -hmm. No. Why not? Right. He, he wouldn't play. He hasn't, he has not touched a baseball or a glove or a bat since he retired. So I think the closest you'll get is the, the Derek Jeter Hall of Fame celebration that the Yankees are having for him. But I, I would be shocked if he showed up to an old timers game and actually played. I mean, he might do the, the Maggio thing where he shows up in uniform and waves to the crowd, but I, I would be very surprised if he uh, 
he picked up a glove and started like throwing like he's he has like no it, it's amazing somebody that like was obsessed with baseball like as soon as he retired it was just like i'm done i'm not playing anymore i'm not throwing with anybody i'm not like doing any of this uh so he like cut that off like right away um, if you can name your next project, is there another sports figure that you would want to make the focus of a documentary? Uh, Lewis Hamilton. Go on. I mean, I'm listening. Uh, I think Lewis Hamilton is another figure where a lot of intersections meet him in the center. And I think that uh, for a sport that was once considered niche is now very global and accessible. And I think that he's part of the reason why that is true. He's not the only reason, uh, but I think that there are a lot of dynamics to Lewis Hamilton's life that um, kind of mirror Derek's in the way, just in terms of like cultural impact and like where he sits in the sport and like transcends the sport. And mm -hmm. again, like things about race and celebrity and pressures and I mean, he was, Lewis Hamilton was basically a child prodigy that like cashed in on his gift. And I think that he's fascinating beyond just like racing, um, which if, if I was to do a sports doc, that's the only story that I would be interested in. Not Lewis, but like this idea that like these athletes transcend the sport that he or she plays in and has a much larger cultural significance than people might give them credit for and exploring that. So I don't really want to do a sports related film that is just like rehashing sports events. Like I'm not interested in that. It's more about the person and their impact. Would you say that's what draws you to pretty much most things you do, having some larger uh, cultural aspect to it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I feel like I feel like art is telling us as much about ourselves as it is the people that we focus on or the stories that we tell or the scripts that we're like filming. So to me, it has to have some kind of cultural referendum attached to it. Um, and I think with everything going on in the world, like I have a particular interest in American society and like what is truly American, what does America really look like? What does it feel like? What is it? Um, do to one another, things like that. So I think that's kind of the story that I've been drawn to over the last couple of years. So as a Yankees fan, how are you feeling about this season? Oh, we're in the World Series, Shakia. <laughs> we'll be, I'm going to be uh, at the Canyon of Heroes in October, like getting crushed <laughs> by other Yankees fans. Uh, so... <laughs> Yeah, that's how I feel about the Yankees this year. Now, is that actually going to happen? I don't know. I'm not, like, predicting anything. But that's how that's how I'm feeling right now, as they are the best team in baseball on July 6th. <laughs> I love the enthusiasm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, before we jump all the way into the Yankees portion of the chat, Scott, um, Marlene has a question. I think it's a good one. What about a woman athlete? Like, what woman athlete would you – want to do a documentary uh honestly right now if we're talking about current events Brittany Griner I mean like what the hell is going on you know and, and why is it happening uh she's one of the great American athletes of the last 10-15 years and now this thing is happening so uh my immediate thought would be Brittany Griner and I think it's a a travesty that it's not the number one sports story. It should have been the number one sports story as soon as it happened. You know, like we rightfully talk about the war in Ukraine, but then there's a basically a hostage in Russia because of the war in Ukraine, and we don't we don't talk about it. You know, it's just dismissed. And uh, I think race plays a part in it. Um, I think the fact that she's a woman plays a very large part in it. You know, I think that there are a lot of obvious reasons and then not so obvious reasons why this is happening. Uh, but I feel like someone at some point needs to tell Brittany Griner's story. Now, I'm not sure that this is the right time because it's still happening, obviously, but uh, that would be one for sure. That's, man, her story is, 
I've been following it pretty closely uh, because at the trip, I've sort of made myself the uh, WNBA person. Um, mm-hmm. And I've been pushing those stories pretty hard. And every every update about her situation is just even more and more like depressing, right? Her letter to the president was like, come on, somebody. Yeah, it's, so, it's, it's infuriating. Like, I don't, I don't find it depressing. I find it infuriating. Like, and it also, it's just, she's a member of a league that is the most activist of all the leagues by far. I mean, mm-hmm. WNBA, the players, coaches, everybody involved in that league has done way more with sports activism than anybody else. You know what I mean? And it's like, they actively try to make this country better. And then the country turns their back on one of those people. You know what I mean? So it's like, there's so many layers to it that it, again, it tells us about ourselves as much as it tells us about that person. So uh, yeah, I, for the wrong reasons, I find it very fascinating, but um, yeah, I mean, that would be the one I would do, like the one that comes to my mind immediately. Aside from the Yankees, are you following any other baseball team this season? Is any other team like catching your interest at all? This year, no, because the Yankees are great. Uh, but uh, I watch baseball. So, I mean, like, I don't, I don't just watch the Yankees. Like, I'm watching as much as I can watch, I will watch it. Um, so a specific team, no, but am I watching other games and do I know like what's going on with other teams? Yes, absolutely. But there, I think there was a, I think last year I was like really into the Padres, like everybody else. And then I kind of like fell off a cliff. Um, the Dodgers, I always watch, I like the West coast teams. Like I like NL West teams. So I'll watch their games like pretty consistently if I'm like still awake uh, because there's there's like an allure with those teams outside of the Diamondbacks. No offense to like D-backs fans, but like the other teams I'm like really fascinated by. But there isn't like one team that I've kind of just like latched on to uh, as much as the Yankees. I do. I do pay attention to the Mets um, just because part of me wants to like laugh at them, but part of me wants them to do well. You know what I mean? Like, I think New York is much better when both teams are going really well. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm very much in tune with like what's going on and I watch the AL East teams for obvious reasons, but the, I haven't like attached myself to a second team this season like I have in the past. My team stinks. So I just watch everybody else be happy. <laughs> that's, that's the way I Tristan agree. McKenzie's good though. He's amazing, right? Yeah, and I good. can't wait until they find a way to trade him. And then <laughs> trade him to the Yankees. It's, it's the dude, Yankees. Don't even play. Don't <laughs> even play like that. Listen, I down. told you, I bought that cute Yankees cap. And whenever I wear it, I feel so dirty, but it is so <laughs> cute. Like, yeah. People are always like, wait, you're wearing a Yankees cap? I'm like, I'll wear any team's hat if it's cute. But, like, they oh, have I to have, know that it's crushing my soul. I have, like, hats from, like, all kind of teams. Like, I'm not yeah. one of those people that's like, I just wear a Yankees hat. Like, I think that that's, you know, it's, I mean, you know, this is it's fashion. You know, it's, it goes beyond just, like, team allegiance. So, yeah, I wear, right. I wear all kind of hats. So we got a question about production. What did a typical day in post-production look like for these episodes? How do you build out a schedule to make seven episodes on budget and on time? Um, so a lot of that is like a producing question. So I wasn't like in the nitty gritty of building the schedule out, but basically you have benchmark dates where you have to deliver cuts to either the EP, um, the EPs and ESPN. So you kind of take those dates, those delivery dates and work backwards. Um, So you'll have that main target. So say you have episode one, say, uh, let's just say the first rough cut is due February 1st. So you work from February 1st back. And then you maybe like two weeks before February 1st, you have the editors deliver a cut that is just internal. So you look at it yourself, you give notes, 
you give them a couple of days to make those changes and you're looking at it again and then you're looking at it again. Now it's a little different because of COVID. Normally you would be in the office together and you would be screening together, but we were in the office right when the uh, Omicron surge happened. So we went remote and we never came back in the office uh, as a total unit. So a lot of it was just links. So we would just get links, constant links, constant links, send notes, have Zoom meetings. And then we're, we're working towards delivering the first rough cut to the EPs. Then we get notes from them, make changes. And then eventually you hit that February 1st date and you send it to ESPN. And then ESPN is uh, giving you notes and then you're just starting the process over. But we had multiple editors. So we had multiple editors working on multiple episodes. So I, I'm just inundated with links. So I'm just looking at links all day and I'm looking at cuts all day. But you build out that schedule, at least like during the offline edit to hit those, those dates. And then you just work backwards. And then um, as long as you're diligent and on top of everything, you, you hit the dates all the time. And in terms of just like budget, you can't be reckless. You know, it's, a, it's amazing what you'll see in a film budget that uh, isn't being very disciplined. You know, there are people taking advantage of money that's there and they spend it on things that they shouldn't be spending it on that's what makes a budget go uh you know past the limitations that you have or they're not buttoned up in terms of like do you have to pay sag because you're using a commercial that has sag actors in it um are you like going through all of the licensing uh deals and like all the uh fine details for a music for a song that you want to license you know what i mean like it's all of those things you just have to have a team that's like really detail oriented and, and focused um on the small things so that you don't go over budget it's like the little things that you feel like you take for granted are the things that come to bite you in the butt later on so you just have to make sure that you're on top of everything it's really like an exercise in, in discipline well we got three questions here so the first one is did you find out anything on Derek when he was with the Columbus Clippers? Uh, no, sorry. <laughs> um, three hour interview sessions. What are some of the things you need to do as a filmmaker to keep the interview subject fresh and engaged so they give you good material? The whole, that's a good question. All the questions are good, but this is a good one because I think I don't look at them as interviews. They're conversations. So if you're creating an environment where people are comfortable and relaxed. They forget about the camera. They forget about the dolly. They forget about the lights. They forget about the mic. They're just talking, you know, and when you're engaging someone that they're in, uh, when you're engaging someone with topics and experiences that they view fondly or have passion for, they'll talk for a very long time as long as it doesn't feel like an interview, it doesn't feel like an interrogation. So like when I spoke, spoke to people, I made it feel like it was a conversation. We were just like in a barbershop or we went out to get a drink <clears throat> and we're just talking. It just happens to be that like I'm recording it. So um, I never steered somebody in a particular direction because I needed a bite or I wanted to like alter the truth. People spoke their truth and their perspective and they were encouraged to do so. So I think that that's another thing when people are told that I'm here to hear your truth, your side of things, they're more apt to engage rather than you fishing for something or trying to like force to force someone to go in a particular direction. They'll pick up on that. I have no interest in doing that. This is not my story. I wasn't there. I didn't play professional baseball. I wasn't in the Yankees clubhouse. So for me, it's a fact finding mission and it's also looking for stories and uh, looking for people's truths. So for me, it's uh, building an environment where people are relaxed and they know that they are comf that they are protected to tell their truth, you know, that they're supported in doing that. Like when I spoke with you, we weren't they didn't feel like an interview. We were just talking. You know yeah, I, mean? I was going to say, I think I could actually speak to that as one of the people you interviewed. I remember everyone telling me you could see the moment that I forgot that the cameras were there because I started talking with my hands, which is what I'm doing right now. Um, but like, I remember afterwards, I just 
sort of zoned out and we were just talking and I wasn't looking at the camera and I wasn't looking at the people moving <laughs> to the side. Like it was for sure a conversation and which is probably why, you know, my answers were what they were um, and people liked them so much because I was just speaking and not rehearsing anything. Yeah, um, not, that for me is not a good interview. Like as a filmmaker in news and journalism, I think it's different. Uh, but you're looking for emotion, emotion and truths and vulnerability. So you have to create an environment and have an approach where that can come out. You know, like one example was Derek's wife. Uh, Hannah was very uncomfortable when we started. And she's very private. She's way more private than Derek. And she was just, she just was nervous, despite being like being a literal supermodel. She was nervous. But you know, we spoke and there were like kind of easy questions that kind of just like guide her into it so she can kind of just like relax. And then I knew that she was comfortable when she just started cursing. You know, first it was excuse my language and then she would curse. And then by like 20 minutes later, she was just coming at you, coming at you, coming at you. She didn't even care anymore. Uh, and she was like laughing in the chair and like giggling when she was thinking about a particular story. So like, those are the things that you want. That's what you're like going for. Um, and you, I don't think you get that if you're like making it feel like an interview or it's clear that you're hunting for something. Like I'm not hunting for anything. Uh, yeah. I think that was the best instruction we got though, that we were allowed to cuss. Like, yeah, cause, yeah. cause yeah. I feel like that's when you relax because you're not monitoring what you say well if you swear not everyone swears you i personally do and it definitely made it a little easier to just keep rambling if i wasn't thinking so hard about what words i was choosing Derek, um eric swears and it like completely threw me off the first time i heard him curse i was like whoa you even know what these words are like you're Derek <laughs> jeter <laughs> like wow this is crazy he curses too Derek jeter Derek jeter swears yeah um <laughs> Um, oh, this is a great question. It's kind of a, it's two people, Hallie and Patrick together. Um, I told you that the music in the first episode was fire. I absolutely love that it was actually from the year that you was being spoken about, which I feel like is one of my biggest things with films. Like, why is this song from 1995 playing in 1988? But you didn't do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> Pat's question is, is Ghostface Killers mighty healthy in the soundtrack of any of the episodes? And Hallie's is, how did you go about building the soundtrack? Uh, okay, so Mighty Healthy was in it, but we had to take it out because the fee was like too expensive compared to like some of the other songs that we have in it. So it was in it to the very end. I tried very hard to keep it, but you know, ESPN music license policy kind of gets in the way and makes things more expensive just naturally. And then, you know, the, the record labels and the publishers are trying to get their, their piece. So I had it in there and then I took it out because uh, I had to make some decisions because there's a budget limitation. So uh, it was in there, but it's not in there anymore. Uh, and what was the second question? How did I build the. How did you go about building the soundtrack? Uh, I was like a backpacker when I was younger. I was like a big hip hop head. So basically it was like songs that I loved that I knew that would fit the era and then just tried to go for it, you know? And, and some of them are like deep cuts. Like it's not like the most obvious choice. Uh, I think when you get to um, the second episode, there are a couple songs that you wouldn't anticipate being in a film. Uh, so a lot of it was just leaning back on like, the songs that made me happy that I thought would fit, you know, it wasn't just like, oh, let me just grab my favorite songs just because, um, but that influenced it. And then it was just something that was appropriate for the time, something that was appropriate for the scene that wasn't like, so like, it just so obvious with the music choice. Um, but I will say this, nobody knows this. Uh, we have about eight unreleased DJ premier uh, instruments. No way. Yeah, so uh, Premier is connected to the Jeter family. He's uh, uh, Derek's nephew's father. So um, he wanted to be a part of the project. And 
he just has obviously like a treasure trove of like beats and he was like yeah here's like a bunch like pick what you want so we have like seven or eight of those unreleased uh tracks that are throughout littered throughout the the film so i'm very excited about that young randy uh that was like one of the things where I was like blown away. I was like, oh my God, like I have access to all these like premiere tracks that nobody's ever heard before. Um, so yeah, it was, uh, that was, that, that was pretty dope. Are we going to be able to purchase the soundtrack or will they like put it on streaming? Uh, that I don't know. Uh, there are like other people that would be making that decision. So I'm not sure, probably not. Uh, because I think that that would take a while just to happen. And also, because this, I mean, this is like a little inside baseball, but because it's a doc, like these labels and publishers kind of give you a discount because it's not a narrative, like the budgets just aren't as big. So I'm not sure if they would want to do that because they, didn't, they gave us like a discount on this. And then it's like, you got to share the sales with everybody. So um, I don't think that's happening, but maybe somebody could put a, make a Spotify playlist and then just like share it with everybody. So. Oh, that would be dope. Yeah. Um, someone stands asking, were there many off the record moments? Yes, there were. Uh, a lot of things that happened like when we weren't rolling that people shared with me, like Brian Cashman shared stories, Reggie Jackson shared stories, Joel Sherman shared stories. David Cohn. I mean, yeah, there were a lot of off the record stories, even Derek. I mean, Derek told us a bunch of stuff um, that that didn't make it, you know, just to protect people. Uh, but yeah, there were. Yeah, I heard, I heard all kinds of stories like I will say this now that it's over, like. Um, when the lockout was happening, we interviewed Hal Steinbrenner and I mean, it's literally the owner of the Yankees and, you know, like free agency was frozen, obviously at the time. And I just flat out asked them like, yo man, what are y'all doing? Like, <laughs> who, are you, who are you getting? You know what I mean? Like what's going on? Like what happened before the lockout? And uh, he told me things. And like, I tried to drop nuggets on Twitter and people were like, oh, you don't have any sources. You don't know what you're talking about. And I'm like literally talking to Hal Steinbrenner. Like, <laughs> oh my goodness. It was like, I know, I knew that they weren't getting Korea. You know, like they weren't getting a big shortstop. I was trying to like draw pins and people were like, no, nah, they're getting Correa. And I was like, I feel pretty certain it's not happening. Like, <laughs> I know a little bit more than you do. Uh, Brian Cashman told me a couple of things, but uh, yeah, man. I mean, I, yeah, I heard all, people were telling me all kinds of stuff, which I appreciated, you know, stuff from Derek's time, things that were going on now. Uh, so yeah, I heard a lot of stuff. Reggie Jackson, by the end, I felt like he was like my, black elder telling me about how to be black in America. And that was incredible. Uh, so yeah, yeah, a lot of stories. I bet he was hilarious. He seems like he has a very big personality. Just oh yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Generally. Um, what are you most proud of from this project as a director? That I was able to finish it. And I know that might sound like a very uh, simple or like a base of answer, but whenever you can finish a project as a filmmaker, that's probably your biggest, biggest accomplishment because it's so hard to make this and it takes so long. And there are so many, especially on this project, there's so many cooks in the kitchen and you have to like be committed to your vision, despite like what people are suggesting or like pushing on you and all those things. So I think walking away with a film that I'm like genuinely incredibly proud of and I know that it's good and I know that people will like it now of course you're gonna have people that are going to nitpick and like criticize it that comes with the territory but I know that it's good you know and I know that it's engaging and I know people will enjoy it you know depending on how they're coming into it as a Yankee fan not a Yankee fan baseball fan or not uh I feel confident that we made a, a really really good film great film according to my producer. So uh, just finishing something that I'm proud of is the biggest accomplishment. Ruth wants to know, do you think Judge stays a Yankee? We're back to Yankee chat now. Yes, I do. I think the Yankees made it way more difficult for themselves, but I think they need each other. I don't think it's a Robinson Cano situation. So 
uh, yeah, I think he'll, I think he'll be back, but it'll, he'll be obviously he's going to be way more expensive than he was a couple months ago. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, how did you get into filmmaking? You know, we Marlene, I didn't ask that. Thank you for bringing us back. Uh, okay, so in college, I kept dropping arts classes because I hated art. Like, wasn't an artist, didn't care for it, didn't draw. Like, I just didn't care. Uh, in my senior year, I needed an art credit to graduate on time. That was like the one requirement that I didn't have because I, I dropped three arts classes the three years prior to my senior year. And the only art class that was open was a video narrative course that was taught by Mary Haverstick, who was an alum of Franklin and Marshall College, where I went to school for undergrad. And uh, she was also a working filmmaker. She taught this class. And I, I, I was so naive and like just not had no idea what movies and movie making and filmmaking was like that. I just thought it was magic on the screen. Like, I didn't know that like regular people could make films. I didn't know that they had digital cameras. I knew absolutely nothing. I just knew that I liked movies and watched movies and that was it. So within the first five minutes, she basically was like, yeah, there's a language to film and you're communicating through this language as a craft and here's Spike Lee and like just threw up some Spike movies and like broke it down. And within the first 10 minutes, I understood exactly what she was talking about. Like, it was almost as if she unlocked this part of my brain that I didn't know was there. And like, I understood the language. As soon as she said there was a language and she was like, this is what you look for. I, it, I just knew it. It was innate. Like I just connected to it and that kind of started it. And then um, I, I had a trial actually with the Kansas City Royals between my junior and senior year. So before I took this class, I was like, I thought I was going to be a major league baseball player or something, right? Uh, and I blew my knee out uh, on Valentine's Day on my last semester in college. So I couldn't finish uh, school on time. So I had to come back the following fall to, to uh, finish and get my degree. And 9-11 happened that September, obviously. And I graduated in December and I didn't want to come back home to New York because it was still a mess. And it was like, what am I going to do in New York? Like, I'm not going to get a job. Like everything just got messed up between my injury and 9-11. So uh, I used to get my hair cut when I had more hair uh, at this black owned barbershop in the white part of town uh, in Lancaster. And they made a joke and they were like, well, they knew I had done this film cl class and I was like really into it or whatever. And they were like, you should just do a movie on us. And I was like, maybe I should do a movie on you. And I pitched it to the school and the school accepted it. So I was able to stay for an extra semester and got a job through the school to make this doc on these on this barbershop. And that's when I really like caught the bug because I, I brought these communities together that like never interacted with each other. It was almost like there was an invisible line between the town and the school. And like, I was able to cross the line and it was like a big success for that area just because the communities merged and started talking to each other. And then eventually I got a job at the school to be a filmmaker in residence. They made up this position for me, for me to stay and make more films. And then I met Spike and I was his host. And then he gave me a recommendation to NYU Film School and then the rest is history. Amazing, yeah. amazing. I knew most of that, but not all of it. So now I know all the details. Yeah. Um, this will be our last question. It's eight, well, nine for you. Um, what's your favorite Spike Lee film? 25th Hour. Really? Why is that? Uh, I feel like Do the Right Thing is like in its own category. Like Do the Right Thing is like a holy grail. So you're almost like cheating to say Do the Right Thing, even though if you said it, I get it. Uh, but I think 25th Hour for me, especially because it, I saw it and it came out during that time when I found filmmaking. So like part of it was the impression it made on me, but it just felt like craft wise, Spike was in his zone. Like Spike was scoring 55 points at Madison Square Garden, we're in a four or five. You know what I mean? It was just like every choice he made was the right choice or felt like the right choice. Like every single shot, cut, line of dialogue structure like everything about it just feels like damn near the perfect film and it's like I always go back to it if I need like inspiration or a reminder of like what the goal is um 
I think that one is like criminally underrated and underappreciated, but I think that that is one of his best films from like a craft standpoint. Like I, I cannot think of many more films that were better than that one. So yeah, 25th hour, easily 25th hour. All right. Well, thank you so, so much for your time. Uh, I think everyone enjoy, I've never seen everyone so captivated that they weren't asking a million questions. Like that was amazing. Yes. Thank um, you. <laughs> so I will talk to you soon and everyone else, thank you for joining and I will see you all soon as well. Have a good night. Good night.